hello how are we all doing today it's thursday it's four o'clock do you know what it means i want to answer your questions i want to answer any questions you've got on god on the bible on anything awesome and i'd love to be able to answer them i've got two that we got beforehand two that we got before we started in fact i think i got more than two i'm quite sure i got at least four maybe even five questions but when i looked for my emails i couldn't find them okay i get a lot of emails and so i couldn't find them so if you've asked me a question and you're hoping for me to answer it today and i don't because you're not there and you're watching it time late delayed or whatever reason if you're here right now just type in your question again i'll get it i've already got one question there praise god and i'll do my best to answer it and if not email me again the week when you're watching say hey, that was my question and i'll go for it next week okay awesome well the first one i've got is um these, these are not in the order they arrived in is in Hebrews 7, and there's some questions about the priest Melchizedek. He also appears in Hebrews 8 as well. And um, what we find out about Melchizedek is that we're told he has no father and he has no mother. And um, basically, um, sorry, I just got another question just coming on the WhatsApp there. I'm just moving it over to that side of the screen. Um, he's got no father, he's not a mother. Is, is he Jesus? Did, when Abraham met Melchizedek in Genesis 15, did he meet Jesus? Who is he? What's going on? And the answer is no, Melchizedek's not Jesus. Melchizedek was a priest and a king, and he served El Elyon. That's what um, Genesis 15 says. He was the, the priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. And I think that's remarkable. Um, Jesus is the son of the Most High. And so uh, Melchizedek's God was our God. He who lives in the secret place of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. Melchizedek lived in the shadow of the Almighty, and Abraham found this priest who served God, served Jehovah in, in the middle of nowhere, really, and uh, tithed to him, and uh, he was blessed by him, and he broke the bread and had the wine with him and had a religious ceremony with him. And so the reason that's important, the reason that's so important to us as Christians, and it's very, very important to us Christians, and it would take probably two or three hours really to emphasize how important it is how important Melchizedek is in scripture is because when Jesus Christ came he was both our priest and our king okay Jesus Christ is both our priest and our king he started a new priesthood and uh, the writer of Hebrews who I believe is Paul you can disagree with if you want that's fine but his plan in writing Hebrews to show how much better better the new covenant was the old covenant our new covenant's better we've got a better deal better covenant better promises better results better everything and we've got a better priest our priest isn't some sort of levite priest it's jesus but immediately the jewish people go hold on a minute that can't be right every priest must come from the house of levi if you're not from the house of levi you can't be a priest jesus christ came from the house of judah so it's okay for jesus to be a king because kings come from judah that's from the house of david and that's allowed but how can he be a king and a priest he can't be both he can't do both because he can't be a priest in the order of levi and he can't be a king from the tribe of judah and so paul writes and he says he, you don't understand he's a different order of priest he's not the same order of priests levite priests die levite priests have to serve sacrifices every day that cover up your sins every day this priest is different he's like melchizedek and then he goes back to the old testament and we read about melchizedek and we find out we don't know a lot about melchizedek we don't know his name. We know his name is Melchizedek, but we, we, we don't know his genealogy, sorry. We don't know his mom. We don't know his mom's name, his dad's name. We don't know grandma's name. We don't know auntie's name. We don't know any of that information. We have very limited information. And what Paul is sharing with us there is that that information is limited and because it doesn't matter. In the Melchizedek priesthood, it doesn't matter who your mom is. It doesn't matter who your dad is. You can be born in any family and still become a priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. And here's the good news. When you got born again, you're now a priest in the order of Melchizedek. You're now in the same order as Jesus Christ. Melchizedek's name literally means in Hebrew, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is, is king and Zedek is righteousness. He's the king of righteousness. And his, his title is king of Salem, which is king of Shalom, the king of peace. Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. That was his name. He was also the king of priests. He was a priest and a king. And um, you are now a king of righteousness and a king of peace. You are now able to bring the gospel and the blessing of God everywhere you go, just like Melchizedek, because that's the order you're in. And it's nothing to do with this guy with some sort of mystical spot. It was just showing you there's a different priesthood where it doesn't matter what family you're from. And that's the priesthood Jesus is from. So it's not Jesus, but he is like so many people in the Old Testament. So many different things in the Old Testament. If you read my blog post at the moment on treeoflifeblog.com, treeoflifeblog.com, then you'll find out that I am doing a series on how the tabernacle, the tent, 
is a picture of Jesus. Does that mean that the, the curtains are really Jesus? No, they're just a picture. Was Melchizedek really Jesus? No, it was just a really good picture of Jesus, a phenomenal picture of Jesus. Just like Moses at different parts of his ministry was a picture of Jesus. Joshua is a picture of Jesus. Joseph was a picture of Jesus, betrayed by his brothers. Betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, um, you know, but God exalted him to the right hand of the, the most powerful man there was. Just like Jesus exalted the right hand of the most powerful being in the universe. And so there's parallels between a lot of people. And the Passover lamb is a picture of Jesus and so on. Um, but other Jesus, no, it's just God has written some beautiful pictures of Jesus into the Old Testament. Okay, hope that helps answer that one. I'm going to score that off there. The second question I've got is on uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. And uh, that scripture says, it's a very strong worded scripture. Paul wrote it. He says, if you don't work, don't eat. If you don't work, don't eat. Now, I believe in that. I, I believe you should get a job. In fact, I've, I've, I've lost more people from Tree of Life because my pastoral advice to them has been, you need to get a job than anything else. Oh, I'm living by faith. I'm in the ministry. If your ministry is not fruitful enough to look after you and for you to have enough money to look after your wife and children, then in the middle of the week, you go and make some tents. You go and do something. You go and work and you go and get a job. But the question I was asked wasn't specifically about that. It was more about, well, what about benefits? Well, the benefit system, the benefit system in the UK. So some more questions coming in on WhatsApp here. Uh, the benefit system in the, the UK is abused. Okay. It should be there as a safety net. Paul in Galatians 6 says, it's very contradictory in a lot of Bibles. It says we should bear one another's burdens, and then he says we should not bear one another's burdens. And so, but if you understand the Greek, and I think the NIV says bear one another's loads, do not bear one another's burdens. There's two words in the Greek for burden. One is a daily burden, like a backpack that we got to carry every day. And Paul's saying don't carry each other's backpacks. You should be carrying the daily burden of your life. You, no one else. You should be paying your bills. You should be paying your electricity. You should be paying for your food. You should be working and eating together. And you should be carrying your daily life. But then Paul then says, we should carry one another's burdens. That's the law of Christ. Well, that word for burden now is a crushing load that came out of nowhere. So I like to distinguish burdens in people's lives as backpack burdens and meteor burdens. Okay. If someone's struggling to carry their backpack, then I shouldn't be carrying that for them. I shouldn't be carrying everyone's backpack for them. I shouldn't be making you dinner. I shouldn't be putting food on your table. You should be doing that. I shouldn't be paying your rent. You should be doing that. But how many of you know sometimes there's meteor problems? You know, I'm talking about the week that the washing machine blows up, the car blows up, um, your house burns down, this happens, that happens, and boom, it's like a meteor comes out. Or you, you've just lost your job. You, you've just been fired because of misunderstanding. You've just lost your wife. Also, meteor stuff, stuff that comes right out of the blue, smacks you and crushes you. At those points, we should get involved and help people. And so the nation took that on board, and the nation developed a benefits system, a benefits system, and that's what it should be for, for crushing loads. But ultimately, you should once that load's lifted off, you should be getting back up, and part of you getting back up is carrying your own backpack and carrying your own load. And then don't, don't tell me I can't work because I've got small children. I mean, when Adam was, was a baby, I'd come home from work. Amanda would literally give me Adam, and she'd go out to work. Well, we, we've done it all. We have done it all because my ministry for a long time, did not produce the kind of money that I could live off. So I worked and I worked and I worked. And even then when I entered the ministry, it didn't pay that much. And Amanda and I have done some part-time jobs since then. Um, we don't now. We're in a real blessed position. The church family is growing. What we do is growing. And, um, you know, we, we're not loaded. Um, we don't take a huge salary. Um, but, you know, we, the, the, the ministry feeds us because our ministry is big enough to feed us. But if it's not, then don't go and live by faith and do that. And if you get on the benefit system, your, your top job, get off that. Get out of that. Work and uh, get some seed. Sow some seed in the ground. Start giving. Start tithing. And start believing for increase and increase and increase. And God wants you to increase. Amen. Now, if you're in a, a mess, I mean, and COVID and the lockdown has created a mess. If you're part of your life family and you're, you're hungry and you're in a mess because something's crushed you, then don't be proud. Contact me. Call me. And we'll make sure you have food in your house by the end of this evening. I'm not going to let anyone in Tree of Life go home, go to bed. Excuse me. <coughs> I will not let anyone in Tree of Life go to bed hungry during this lockdown. I won't do it. The, the, the church has got the money to, to deal with that. Okay, so that's that question. I hope that's answered um, well, and I hope that helps you. Okay, so I've got a few more here that have been coming in before the meeting, and then I'll start going through these questions here that have come in here. Quite a few of them now, which are fantastic. Um uh, there's a question here on um, 
I believe it's Hebrews 10. If we sin willfully after we've received knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Can you explain this verse when Jesus redeemed us and does not impute sin to us? Absolutely true. So this is not talking about the sin of sin. Okay, just sinning. Okay, it's not talking about murder, adultery, lying, um, losing your temper and swearing at the dog. None of those things. It's talking about those. You can be forgiven for all those things. You can be forgiven for any sin. However, you notice that word there, willfully. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that I sin deliberately. All sins are deliberate to some degree. You know, it's like, like that pastor in Florida, mega church pastor in Florida last year. You know, I'm sorry, I accidentally committed adultery. You didn't accidentally commit adultery. What a moronic thing to say. It, was it really dark and, and you, you thought it was your wife? I mean, you, you don't, don't, don't patronize us. All sins have a deliberateness in them at some level. But this is talking about a willful rejection of our salvation. Okay, it's not talking about a sin as in I've messed up and I've sinned, I've done something selfish and rude and horrible. It's talking about a willful rejection of our salvation. That was what was happening in the book of Hebrews. Um, lots of questions from Hebrews today, interesting. But in the book of Hebrews, the, the people who are the Jewish people, um, basically, Christianity was an illegal religion, according to the Romans. They, they didn't like the fact that the Christians said Jesus Lord. You know, they thought it was a challenge to Caesar as Lord. And so Christians were illegal at this stage in the Roman Empire. They'd been persecuted. You couldn't buy or sell if you were a Christian. You weren't allowed to go to the market and buy stuff. You weren't allowed to sell stuff and make money. It, you were really um, being persecuted for being a Christian. So some of the Jews who had become Christians said, well, we'll go back to Judaism. Judaism is just the same, really. That's why Paul wrote Hebrews, because it's not the same. It's better. It's got a better covenant, better savior, better priest, which we just talked about. It's better. And what Paul is saying is saying, you turn your back on Jesus. If you deliberately reject you, you say, I am not a Christian, then you are not going to be get all the benefits of being a Christian. Now, Paul says this also in, Roman, in Hebrews chapter 6 as well. He says it twice. That's a very serious thing. Now, Paul says you have, that there's some caveats to it. You, ha you have to have been born again. You have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You have to be mature. You have to have tasted the word. Okay? Just like there's caveats in family, you know. You, you, your four-year-old daughter says, I hate you, Daddy. I don't want to see you again tough you're a child you know and god knows that when we're mature we have temper tantrums sometimes we throw our bible at the wall we rip up our bible we swear we shout we say i hate you god and he still loves us he still forgives us but if you deliberately as an adult as a mature christian if my, if my daughter is 14 you know she turned 24 34 and says dad i hate you i don't want to see you again i'm i'm, I'm gonna legally separate from you change my name she could disappear there's nothing i can do about it and if you turn your back on jesus and say, you know i'm gonna become a muslim I'm going to confess Allah. I'm going to confess Muhammad as his prophet. And I'm going to become a Muslim. And you sin willfully. You willfully reject Jesus. You see, sin can't cause you to lose your salvation. Because sin never got, uh, not sinning never got you saved. What got you saved was putting your trust and faith in Jesus. But if you then repudiate that decision, willfully decide, I, I, don't, I don't need Jesus. I don't want Jesus in my life. I hate Jesus. I'm against Jesus. I'm just going to do it on my own. When I get to heaven, can you just judge me on my sins, please? Man, you are in trouble. You are in big, big trouble. Do not do that, okay? Now, I think it's very hard to get to that place. But as you sin more and more, as you do more and more against the Lord, your heart can harden. You will, you'll end up in that place. Yongi Cho pastored a million people in 50-something years of ministry, and he said he'd only met one person who'd ever made that choice. So it doesn't happen often, but it can happen. So don't sin. Don't mess up. Don't harden your heart. Keep your heart soft before Jesus. Okay, sin does not cost you your salvation. If you feel bad, you haven't turned your back on Jesus, okay? Just tell God you love him, and you'll feel the love of God in your heart, and you'll know. God loves you, and God cares for you, okay? Don't let that verse beat you up, okay? Let it beat you up if you deliberately think of becoming a Muslim or a Mormon and turn your back on Jesus and saying, I don't need him, okay? Because that really would be a dumb thing to do. Praise God. Uh, there's also another scripture, another question here about Jude 1 and verse 9. That's a great question there. Why did Satan and Mike Michael dispute over Moses' body? Um, I have no idea what the dispute was over. I've got a couple of ideas. Uh, Moses came back at one stage, didn't he? Moses and Elijah both came back and sat with Jesus. And I just wonder if Satan somehow, if he got hold of the body, could somehow stop that happening. But somehow God knew that Moses had to come back at a certain point, not in his body, but just there. And also, it's also about victory, isn't it? The idea that Moses couldn't get to the promised land and so on. The devil likes to embarrass us when we fail. 
And I think it might have just been to embarrass Moses and embarrass the people of God. And why did Moses dare not bring an abusive condemnation to him? Because they were the same rank. They were both angels. Even though Satan had turned against God, and brought, they were the same rank. M Michael dared not rebuke Satan. But you see, a lot of people tell us, well, we must not rebuke Satan. You know, don't be stupid. You know, oh, Satan makes you sick. And you just go, well, I, I, I dare not rebuke him. No, you bear rebuke him. You've never been at the same rank of Satan. You've been above a much higher rank. You are in Christ Jesus, and you can resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, so don't get upset about that. You just charge at the devil. You rebuke the devil. Now, you don't have to you stupid devil. You blankety blank devil. You this. You don't do that. Just, just tell him to go. Believe he goes, and then go back to worshiping God. You know, don't spend hours focused on the devil. Focus on him just enough to get him out of your life, and then turn your eyes back on Jesus. Amen. So there are all the questions that came in beforehand. Now we'll start the question that came today, man. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions, okay? But I'm really glad. Hello to Lydia. That's my daughter there. Glad you're watching, darling. Um, so Pam asks, how does Matthew 25, 1 to 13, of the 10 virgins relate to modern Christians? I'm absolutely convinced, Pam, I've answered this previously on another Q&A. Okay, so I want you to just go back and watch the previous ones. I bet Lee's just tuned in right now. Lee said at the prayer time, he said, every time I tune in, Ben goes, I answered that last week. Okay, but um, have a look through some of the old ones. I'd try and put the questions on, and I've definitely answered that one before, so I'm not going to go and answer that one again. Awesome. UK Dove Girl, how did the person survive three days in the belly of a whale? Did they go oxygen to breathe? Is it a parable? How did the man not die or see one in the back of the fish where I often wonder? Well, let me tell you straight off, I don't believe there's a parable. I believe this is history. I believe the book of Jonah is history. I believe it happened. And I believe that Jonah survived in the whale. And uh, that's what I believe. Um, there was a man in the 19th century. I'm just trying to see if I can um, get, um, get the historical proof. But there was a Victorian guy who actually survived a day inside a whale. Okay, that actually happened, and so um, it, it can happen. And, you know, it's not unbelievable. Now, the, the, the Hebrew word is dag, dag, which is a fish. Um, you might have heard of the Hebrew, the, the, the Canaanite god Dagon, the Philistine god Dagon, who um, they, they put the ark in the temple of Dagon. That's the fish god, the big head of a fish. Okay, and um, I believe it was a whale. I personally believe it was a whale. The, the, the King James translators used whale, that was the biggest fish they knew, and um. You know, God prepared that fish to take care of Jonah. So I think when it says God prepared it, God took care of it. You know, God prepared that fish. If that fish had too much salt in its stomach or too much acid in its stomach. God somehow prepared that fish. That's um, Jonah 117, and that got it ready. That got the fish ready to prepare Jonah. I believe it was a miracle. There are certainly whales big enough for a man to go inside and go in hole. And uh, the, the guy I'm talking about, I've just found it here on Google, James Bartley, 1891. Um, they were hunting a whale near the Falkland Islands. And uh, I'm just reading it off the screen now, so I'm looking over there. Bartley fell into the sea and disappeared. The whale was killed. And the next day, they caught a whale, opened it open. Bartley was still alive inside the whale's stomach. Now, here's something interesting. I don't, I'm not saying this is thus saith the Lord. But when he came out of the whale, Bartley, because he was inside the whale's stomach, the acid in there meant he was white. His face, hands, and neck, he looked like parchment. That's what it says. He said, I would have lived in there until I starved to death. I only passed out because I was scared. I had plenty of air. That's what Bartley said. Uh, this was in the newspapers in 1892. It was in a book in 1924. Um, the only person I ever seemed to have counted at the time was an Anglican vicar. And uh, the captain then wrote back and said, this is true. And the captain's wife wrote back and said, I was there. And um, this is true. This is a true story. And so these people clearly saw this happen. And so I do wonder if that whiteness, if Jonah came out, that whale, vomited out the whale, looked horrific. And that was part of the reason everyone suddenly repented when he turned up looking out as a, as a ghost. Okay, awesome. Praise God. And um, Jonah's really a sign because Jesus said the only sign you'll get is the sign of Jonah. And the sign of Jonah was a preacher who spent three days and three nights in the dark. And Jesus Christ is that preacher who spent three days and three nights in the dark. Another picture of Jesus like Melchizedek is in the Old Testament. I love how the questions are all tying together today. Praise God. And so Amanda said, I forwarded the three questions. That's right, and they're the ones I've just done. So thank you, Amanda, my darling. Thank you so much. Uh, Chaos, what to make of 2 Kings 13.21? Well, I don't know off by heart, okay? I'm not sure if you expected me to, but I'm just going to Google it right now, 2 Kings 13. Um, let's get the whole chapter up so I can put a little bit of context into it, okay? 
And so here we are. Yeah, and this is this is the the, the guy who was resurrected when he touched Elijah Elisha's body. Yes, yeah, so, so Elisha clearly had so much power on his body, his dead body, that when someone touched, he died. You know, we have the glory of God in us. Peter's shadow healed the sick. Even in the Old Testament, there was that kind of power. The people people got healed around the people of God. Miracles happened. And so Elisha's body was just lying there. But Elisha's body, the power of God had flowed through it so many times that it was still connected somehow to that power. You know, he was dead. Even though Elisha was happy in heaven and praising God and whatever else, his body still had power and he touched it and he revived. And I mean, it's an amazing story. Resurrection power. You know, if, if, if a dead prophet in the old covenant, the worst covenant, can raise someone from the dead, then you as a, a, a living prophet, as a living priest, as a living king in the New Testament can raise someone from the dead. Amen? Amen. It's supposed to be encouraging. Praise God. Hope it encourages you, Kay. Fortunate. Hello, Ben. Hello, fortunate. In Luke 11, Jesus' disciples asked him to teach him to pray. And his response, uh, why the subject matter changed to asking for the Holy Spirit? That's a great question, isn't it? Now, let's remember something, okay? And uh, those of you who were in Dagnum the last time Gregory de Cow came and spoke in the Dagnum church will remember he ripped the page out of his Bible. And he ripped the page that said the New Testament. And he took it out. Instead of being before Matthew 1, he put it in at John 19. Because the New Testament is in the blood of Jesus. This is the New Testament in my blood. Amanda and I will do communion tomorrow uh, at 2 o'clock. We'll have the bread and the wine. New Testament in my blood. So until the blood of Jesus was shed, everything that happens beforehand is still Old Testament. Yes, Jesus knew the te New Testament was coming. But everything Jesus did was Old Testament. So a lot of th this prayer here, the Lord's Prayer, is actually him teaching his disciples before the cross how to pray. And so he then teaches about asking, seeking, knocking. And then he says, your father will give the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's because you really need to understand that you need the Holy Spirit to pray effectively. Now, these guys couldn't get the Holy Spirit. They couldn't be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. But they still needed to know that in a year or two from now, they needed to get the Holy Spirit. But now, as born-again Christians in the New Covenant, especially if we're Spirit baptized, we've got the Holy Spirit inside us. We can speak in tongues. We pray with the Spirit. We don't pray for the Spirit. We pray with the Spirit. We don't pray for the Spirit, which is awesome news for us in our new, better covenant. Hope that helps. Awesome. You've just tuned in. Well, welcome, whoever you are who's just tuned in. There was an account of a man who was in a whale in more recent times. Yeah, James Bartley, we did talk about him. Awesome. Praise God. Can I shout out your friend, Yarek? Well, go on then, Dennis. Hello, Yarek. How are you doing? God bless you. Awesome. Yeah. Amanda's just said, Jesus mentioned the account of Jonah and the belly of the in the gospel, so we can trust it if Jesus believed it. Absolutely. You know, it's amazing how many people attack the Old Testament and say, well, that couldn't have happened. God couldn't create Adam and Eve at the beginning. There must be millions of years of evolution before that. And Jesus said, at the beginning, God made the male and female. Jesus quoted Jonah. Um, there's a lot of Old Testament scholars. I was certainly taught this at Bible school. They teach that Isaiah was two separate people. And, you know, Jesus quotes Isaiah at the beginning and Isaiah at the end. And he, he says the same Isaiah says. So, you know, I just believe Jesus. That's absolutely true, man. It's a really great point. Awesome. Praise God. No, uh, that's why we're here, UK Dove Girl, to answer these questions and to help gain knowledge. There is no shame in not knowing anything. There's a lot of things I don't know. In fact, the more I learn, the more I think I don't know. Uh, a few years ago, I reckon God was a bathtub and I had about a cup full. Now God's an ocean. And I reckon I've got about a teaspoonful. You know, there's so much more. Praise God. Okay. At the rapture, I believe the children of believers who have not reached the age of accountability will be raptured with them. I agree, Winford. I believe that too. And I believe that if there's only one parent's a believer, I believe that child will still be raptured. Um, according to uh, 1 Corinthians 7, that the unbelieving... Uh, the believing parent sanctifies the household. Will the children of unbelievers who have not reached age of accountability also be raptured? Or will they go through the tribulation? I personally believe they'll be raptured. Uh, um, that's my own personal opinion. I couldn't really back that with scripture. Um, and so just to let everyone know about this age of accountability, there's an age where we don't know the law. Paul talks about in Romans 7. So ch when children are born, they're babies, they don't know what's right and wrong. Um, in fact, that's in Jonah as well. But when Jonah's upset that God doesn't destroy Nineveh, he says 120,000 children in Nineveh. And he uses the phrase, those who don't know right from left. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know what's wrong. And so there comes a stage in everyone's life when they realize they've done something wrong. Normally, it's about seven-ish, but some people, they, they, they develop quicker than others. Some people develop slower than others. Some people, because of different issues they have, they never get to the age of accountability. They never, ever get to an age where they realize right is wrong. In the UK, um, if you're under 10 years old, you cannot be held accountable for your actions. That's the law 
in this country. Now, again, that doesn't take count. Some nine-year-olds are really quite bright, and some 11-year-olds are, you know, haven't got there yet and haven't developed to that point yet. But there has to be a law. There has to be an age gap. You know, the law can't account for everyone, but God does. God is capable of accounting for all these different people. And so I believe, believe personally that children haven't reached the age of accountability will also be raptured. But I can't back that up with anything other than um, really the only scripture I've got for it, Winford, would be, uh, is it Genesis 15, Genesis 17, where Abraham is praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, would you actually punish the righteous with the unrighteous? And I see God counts those babies as righteous. Um, they're not righteous. They're born in sin. They're born spiritually dead. But because they don't know, God counts them as righteous. They're credited as righteous. And so I don't think God's going to judge the righteous with the unrighteous. That's my opinion on it. That's my take on it. Okay. What type of study Bible should I buy? Um, Battlefield of the Mind Run by Joyce. That sounds like a good one. Um, there's so many different ones. I, I, I have uh, many different Bibles. I've just been tidying up my office, so most of my Bibles are on the windowsill. I'm not going to get them. Uh, my favorite Bible at the moment is a Maxwell Study Bible. That's a, a leader's study Bible. Um, I also have a lot of Bibles that aren't study Bibles. Uh, for a long time, study Bibles put me off because I'd, I'd look to the notes. And I don't want to look to the notes. I want to look to the Bible. So I, I didn't have one for a long time. You know, um, really, what's a bigger question than what study Bible you should buy is uh, what translation should you read? Read a translation that feeds you and you find easy to read. Um, I like to read the New Living and I like to read the King James. I find them both quite easy to read. Um, but I will often have four or five different translations when I'm preparing for a sermon. Um, I just did a blog post today, uh, really on a verse, Galatians 4.18. Um, but I quoted it in the message, I quoted it in the Passion, and I quoted it in the New King James because each one brought out a different thing. So... You know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, a lot of its preference, a lot of its preference. Um, the one thing I will say is if you buy a Bible like the Message, like the Passion, um, the Moffat's Bible, Weymouth's Bible, um, that's been translated by one person, okay, then you have to be very careful that's just one person. So you have to don't don't push too much weight on that because it's just one person translating. Whereas you've got something like the NIV or the King James where you had dozens and dozens and dozens of translators, then there's checks and balances. And so I'm not saying don't read the message, don't read the passion, don't read those things. They're beautiful, they're powerful. But I would just say don't ever put too much weight on them as a study Bible. Okay, if you want to study the Bible, you know, if, you, if you've seen a Joyce Meyer Bible you like and, um, you know, Battlefield for the Mind is a great topic, then, then get that one. You know, I, I, I can't see it being a bad thing, you know. Awesome. Praise God. Um, I think I've done it. I think I've done all the questions. Any more questions, guys? I've been going for nearly half an hour, so I've got time to fit in one last question. So fastest fingers has it. Um, awesome. Let me just check the WhatsApp. Um, praise God. Well, there's another question on the WhatsApp. I didn't realize. Sorry, there is one more question on the WhatsApp. I'll still I'll still leave time for you to answer. Ask another question on YouTube as well. But the other one is of worst punishment. Do you suppose will he be thought worthy? You trample the Son of God underfoot, count the blood of covenant by which you were sanctified, a common thing, insulted, spirit of grace. Um, that is still part of that first that, that Hebrews ten. That's all part of that same passage that we actually mentioned earlier. You know, and if you trample the Son of God underfoot, if if, if you have been a Christian. And then you reject Christ and you reject Christ and you get to heaven and you say, God, I don't need Christ. I want you to let me in by my own goodness. And you've turned your back on Jesus and trampled on the blood and rejected the blood. Man, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. You never get too old to need grace. You never get so good. You don't need the grace of God. We always need Jesus. We always need, always need a savior. Awesome. Praise God. When Winford's got a use of the New King James, he amplified the new living and the passion. That sounds like a nice balance there, you know, of different ones together. That's why it's used the King James and the New Living, because the King James is very close to the Greek. And so, I mean, I mean I've, I've done five years of Greek, so I can stunt, I can read it in the Greek. Uh, but it's, it's similar to the Greek, and so it's easier for me to get the syntax of the Greek. It's easier for me to guess what Greek words being used. Um, whereas the New Living, you could read three or four chapters quite easily um, because it's written very easy to read English, but that means it's further away from the Greek. And that's how basically your translation, that's how you decide your translation. You know, how close to the Greek is it, but also how readable English is it. So something like the New American Standard, very, very close to the original Greek, but very, very awkward English. So you then kind of go on a little bit of a spectrum, and then you end up at ones that really are, are removed from the Greek, like the, the one-man translations, the message, the passion, and so on. Um, which are great, they're very helpful, they're very useful, but don't put too much weight on them. Awesome, praise God. Thank you for your hard work. You're more than welcome, my darling. 
Awesome. So here's here's my question here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female created them. Did God create all the spirits of mankind that ever lived, or was it only the spirits of Adam and Eve that he created in Genesis 1, 27? I believe that he only created the spirits of Adam and Eve. I believe that um, whenever we um, have a baby, whenever a man and woman have a baby, uh, I'm not going to get into too much technical detail, but um, as that air, egg is fertilized, I believe a spirit is then created. I believe that's when the spirit is created. And uh, that's why I believe the act is called procreation. We're actually involved in creating. Because you see, at the end of the day, as humans, we're spirit beings. And spirit gives birth to spirits. For a spirit being, I can give birth to another spirit being. And so that's what I believe. I don't believe God is actively involved every time a baby's born. I believe he's any more than he's actively involved any time an acorn becomes an oak tree and then has more acorns. God created every tree with a seed inside it. He created humans with seed inside them, men with seed inside them, women with eggs inside them. And when the egg and seed match and they, they come together and life is created, I believe that part of that life is the spirit. So the spirit, soul, and body all are birthed onto at the same time and then carefully looked after inside the female for nine months. And then they're born and that baby is born spirit, soul, and body. They don't have to grow in their spirit because it's, it's born. They, they need to be born again in their spirit. They, they need to grow in their soul. They need to learn and develop and find out about life. And their body obviously needs to grow. But um, the spirit doesn't grow. The spirit is intact. I, I want to say perfect, but it's not perfect because it's spiritually dead. It needs to be connected with God. But I, I believe the spirits are created every time a human is created. Uh, the, um, because otherwise you've got strange ideas that these spirits are sort of hanging around in heaven waiting for you to have a baby. And what if you decide not to have a baby? What if you decide to use contraception? And the spirits are, oh man, can't be born. You know, I, I don't think that's how it happens. Okay, I think that we actually procreate. That's the authority and dominion we have on this earth. That's why he told Adam and Eve, go forward and multiply. Go forward and take dominion over the earth. Okay, praise God. Thank God for tree of life. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, why do you think the woman calls the woman a helper? What do you think it means? That's a great question. And uh, I'm going to look up this um, word. I, I know what the word means. I've got it. I know what the dictionary definition of it is in Hebrew, but I can't remember the words. It's just slipped my mind. Um, where are we? What verse is it? The verse where it says she's a helper. It's Genesis 2.20. Genesis 2.20. And the word is ezer. And it means a helper. That's what it means. It literally means a helper. Um, I was hoping. I can't see it there in Strong's definition. I thought it was there. But it, it means that one who helps is an equal. It doesn't mean like a slave or a servant. It's a very equal thing. God didn't take women out of man's foot so she could stand on her. And he didn't take women out of the, the skull so she could do all the thinking for him. He took him out of the ribs so she could protect his heart and she could be side by side with him. And that's how God created male and female. In fact, that word is a, God used it himself. He said, I'm the help of Israel. So he's quite happy to use that word about himself. And so it's not a negative word. It's not a word that, you know, that, you know, um, I, I believe in headship of the, the home. I believe that a man should be the head of the female. I believe that. I believe that um, Ephesians and Colossians talk about that. But um, it's, it's a very strange way of looking at things that then becomes a dictator. That's very carnal. Um, you know, um, Amanda and I counsel a lot of couples, and we spend a lot of time with couples making sure the marriages are strong. You can't have a strong church without strong marriages and strong families. You can't do it. It can't be done. And so this issue of submission often comes up. And I always tell people, I tell the men, because I talk to the men, man or man, and I say, guys, you want your wife to be in submission, but there's no mission. There needs to be a mission. And if a man is called to help me, then what am I doing? That needs help. Because if all I'm doing is sitting on the sofa and drinking beers and watching football, she, how does she help? Bring me a beer? That gets boring pretty quick. But if I'm planting churches all over the UK and I'm raising the dead and I'm traveling all over, then that's fun to help. It's easy to come under that mission because it's a clearly defined mission for me, for my wife, and for my family, and for everything else. So that's where helper is. Okay, man, we're, we're flowing with questions now. Um, this is going to be the last one because I'm going to wrap it up because I've gone over time now by five minutes. Any more questions? Come back next week. We'll have more questions at four o'clock next Thursday. The Bible says that God's given man power and authority in the earth, and yet earth belongs to man. Yet it seems God sovereignly intervened in stopping man from building the Tower of Babel. Did God usurp his own delegated authority? No, he didn't. 
He absolutely didn't. You see, and this this is this is why. This is why God was absolutely limited in what he could do. Again, because he gave the dominion of the earth to humans. Why is earth such a mess? Because we made it a mess. God's place where he starts authority, heaven, looks pretty good. However, God could do things in the spirit realm. And language is a spiritual thing. Language comes from spirit. Words come from spirit. Therefore, it's not illegitimate of God to mix up the languages because they never came from earth. Words never came from earth. Words created earth. In fact, that's the only thing that's come over from the spirit. You've got to remember, God spoke spirit. God doesn't speak physical words because he didn't have a physical mouth at the time. He does now with Jesus, but he didn't have a physical mouth. He had a spiritual mouth. And with spiritual mouth, he said, let there be light. And there was light. With the spiritual mouth, he made humans in his image. With spiritual words, words that could only be heard in heaven, but they crossed into the earth. So the earth was defined and controlled by spiritual words. Now, when Adam and Eve started speaking, God said, you have dominion. Your words now do it. And God stepped right back. So he can't do anything. But the one thing he can do is words. Now, there's not sophistry here. This is, this, is, this is how God works. He could change the way we speak words. Because that still came from him. That was the only connection he had to earth. And he disrupted the way we spoke words. Why? So that we wouldn't all speak the same thing and all curse God together and all build a tower to earth together and, 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 and all mess up together. So that was the only thing he could do. And that's what he did. Um, that's, my, that's my take on it anyway. Praise God. It was a great question. All great questions today. Really good. Well, I'm going to disappear now. I've had a great time. I hope these have helped. I hope these have blessed you. And um, if you want to watch them again, we'll be on YouTube. I'll upload this to YouTube in the next couple of minutes.